Sir Terry Wogan is a son of Limerick, a city for which he retains an unshakable affection. He was educated at Crescent College, the successor to the first Jesuit school in Ireland. When Terry was 15, his family moved to Dublin, and Terry transferred to Belvedere College, another Jesuit institution. He did not emerge from this education with conspicuous piety, <laughs> but Belvedere is a school that aspires to mould young men prepared to live for others in leadership and example in the pursuit of a just world. That is an aspiration that has left its mark on Terry Wogan's character. After leaving school, Terry embarked on a career in banking. Had he persevered, bankers might have a public image as genial and generous fellows, fully deserving of their vast bonuses. <laughs> in the event, however, this proved to be a false start and Terry soon became a broadcaster with Radio Telefi Sharon, the Irish equivalent of the BBC. He began with interviews and documentaries, but soon moved to light entertainment, notably to a game show called Jackpot. This ran till 1967, whereupon RTE decided to drop it. <laughs> Terry had by this point developed bad habits, such as eating every day, and he had a young wife, Helen, who is with us today. So he approached the BBC Light program, the precursor of Radio 2, to ask whether they had any work for him. In one of the BBC's wisest decisions, they hired him. And Terry was soon working as a disc jockey on a program called Midday Spin. In 1967, the BBC reacted to the growing popularity of offshore pirate stations such as Radio Caroline by inaugurating Radio One. And Terry immediately migrated there as the DJ on the Tuesday evening edition of Late Night Extra. This toehold gradually led to the conquest of the mountain because Terry established a two hour afternoon show broadcast on both Radio One and Radio Two. He created an unprecedented following of some six million listeners and became a national figure. In 1972, he took over a morning show and called it Wake, Wake Up with Wogan. Here, Terry raised listening figures to more than seven million, but he declined to think of his audience in terms of figures, preferring instead to think of them as friends. He called them togs, Terry's old geezers or Terry's old gals. And this is characteristic of the warmth that made Terry Wogan the European broadcaster with the highest number of listeners. In the same period, Terry's gift for not taking himself too seriously manifested itself in his short-lived career as a singer, notably with the floral dance, but also with me and my elephant. His morning radio program ended for the first time when Terry moved full-time into television. But he returned in 1993, and it ended for a second time on 18 December 2009, which was a national day of mourning. Terry, however, declined to mourn, assuring his friends, by which he meant his listeners, that he would not miss the early mornings when crocodiles still roam the streets. Once again, the demise of Wogan on the airwaves was announced prematurely, and on Valentine's Day this year, there was a second resurrection, this time in the form of Weekend Wogan, and that lives on, for which millions are grateful. In his early years on television, Terry Wogan chatted contentedly for seven years on a show simply called Wogan, for eight years on one called Points of View, and then for two series of Wogan Then and Now. His biggest impact, however, has been on three programs that he presented or presents and annually. And each of them reveals something about Sir Terry's character. BBC Proms in the Park testify, testifies to his enduring love of music of virtually any type. The Eurovision Song Contest, which he presented for 35 years, was on one level a showpiece for T Terry's integrity as well as his longevity. He could be sharply critical of dreadful singing and costumes 
and of voting determined by re regional loyalties rather than musical merits, and his generosity was bottomless. And when this role finally came to an end, he described the show as the world's greatest international television event, exciting, camp, foolish, spectacular, fun, the most brilliantly produced three and a half hours of live television ever seen. The third program is the BBC Children in Need. The idea of a BBC appeal had a history stretching back to 1927 when it took the form of a five-minute broadcast. Indeed, Terry took part in this five-minute broadcast twice in the late 1970s. Thereafter, it was Terry Wogan who lifted this event into the mainstream, and through the years, he raised half a billion pounds for this charity. Now, alongside this career in broadcasting, Terry Wogan is a writer. He's modest about his books, but that is because he is a modest man, not because his books fall short of the mark. Indeed, the delight of the books derives from his ability to transfer his voice and characteristic idiom onto the printed page. The books, like the man, are self-effacing and witty, and they are descriptions of the world from which Terry came and the very different one that he now inhabits. The one to take to your desert island is the autobiographical Mustn't Grumble, which contains some extraordinary sketches of figures in his childhood, as well as an account of his broadcasting career. What lifts this, this book above conventional autobiography is an imaginative sympathy for characters who are not likable. Sir Terry's impulse is to understand rather than to condemn, and that says something about his character as well as his skill as a writer. Now, Terry Wogan has rightly been honored for this life that has been lived to create happiness in others. These honors include the freedom of Limerick and London, an honorary OBE, an honorary knighthood, a knighthood in ordinary, and a Blue Peter Gold badge, which is the Blue Peter equivalent of the Order of Merit. In a moment, he will be honored by this university. And you may wonder why it is the University of Leicester that is conferring this honor, and why Sir Terry is according us the honor of accepting it. The answer lies in a running joke on Radio 2, when Terry Wogan referred to Leicester as a lost city, one that was mentioned in traffic reports because of maintenance work on the motorway, but was otherwise unknown to humankind. <laughs> and just as Schliemann announced in 1868 that he had discovered the lost city of Troy, so Terry Wogan announced his discovery of Leicester in November 1984. Since then, he has discovered that the city has a world-class university that he tells his listeners rightly is the best university in the universe. And he has on several occasions used the facilities of the university to host the three-day Mardi Gras that is the TOGS convention. His immense capacity for friendship <laughs> now extends to this university and we heartily reciprocate. Mr. Chancellor. On the authority of the Senate and of the Council, I present to you Michael Terence Wogan that you may confer upon him the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. Sir, I admit you to the honorary Doctor of Law. Congratulations, sir. Distinguished guests, Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, <laughs> I've always wanted to say this on a stage. Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> <laughs> it, does, it does remind me of the great actor Sir Ralph Richardson, who was known for his eccentric ways. <laughs> and he, was, he was in this play, and in the middle of a scene, he stopped, walked to the footlights, and said, is there a doctor in the house? And a hand went up, and he said, Oh, doctor, isn't this a terrible play? 
Now, I wonder if you realize or can understand how much of an idiot you can feel when you stand on a stage <laughs> while a very distinguished man extols your virtues. It's uh, humbling, at the very least, to say the very least. And furthermore, he said everything that I was ready to say. <laughs> so this, you'll be pleased to know, it's going to be a very brief speech. Now, um, speaking as somebody who never went to university, uh, I'm, I'm so pleased to see so many of you graduate after so many hard years of study. There's a very young student there in the <laughs> And um, it's a relief that none of you are going to end up like me. Hobbledy hoy, fired by the BBC. Luckily, uh, my wife is uh, privately wealthy. So, you know, <laughs> and other lives. Now, my association with Leicester, as you so rightly say, goes back an awful long time because I left the fastnesses of the BBC one day on some pretext, I don't know why, and they said, go north, young man. So I, I crossed over the Watford Gap <laughs> with some apprehension. And as we drove along the M1, I saw this misty city on a hill. And I thought, let's go and see what that is. So we came off the dreaded M1, but we could never find it. <laughs> and so as far as me and millions of listeners were concerned, and, and probably you, uh, it's the lost city of Leicester. And when the Leicesterians heard that, they invited me to come up here, and I am the proud possessor of... Same to you, pal. <laughs> The Lester Spoon, presented to the intrepid traveler, Terry Wogan, who discovered Lester on the 21st of November, 1984. <laughs> and so I did. And damn it, it's still here. <laughs> and I've also got this. This also, I bring with me nearly everywhere, because usually I find people rush the stage. And I fight them off with this. <laughs> The eighth day of December, 1993, I, Terry Wogan, hereby confirm and attest that I have found the city of Leicester to be a wondrous and surprising place, and that I shall hereafter refer to it as Leicester, a city full of surprises. <laughs> and that, signed by me as testator, and the Lord Mayor of Leicester at the time, a Henry Dunphy. Sounds like a man of Irish antecedents. And so we come to the university, and as you say, my association with the university is one of enormous affection, and even greater affection now that it has foolishly presented me with an honorary doctorate, which I shall boast about until I die. <laughs> which is not for a long time yet. <laughs> because that's the great thing about our business, as, as you will see from some of the crustier people who appear on the television, you never have to retire. So those of you who uh, qualified as medical doctors, you're making a terrible mistake. You should have gone into showbiz. <laughs> it's, it's more regular. And if, you, uh, if you're as lucky as Jonathan Ross, you're going to be paid an awful lot of money <laughs> for doing very little. <laughs> so the University of Leicester, my togs, Terry's old girls and geezers. There are some with me in the audience. I won't embarrass them by asking them to stand up. But these are people who have rallied together under my name. Now, in my previous incarnation as a broadcaster, I had followers who were called twits. The Terry Wogan is top society. Or twinkle toes. Terry Wogan is not kinky, like everybody says or everybody thinks. <laughs> <laughs> so I then went off to do television. It got tired of me, and I came back to do the radio. And my daughter, after a couple of years, said, what about those old geezers who listen to you? So I happened to mention it on the radio, and all the old geezers rallied round and were proud to call themselves Togs, 
or in the case of younger ones, Tiggs, Terry's young geezers. Now, at first, they needed me. Now they couldn't care less. <laughs> because they formed themselves into an extraordinary society that does good. These are people who do good without praise. When you mention children in need, I'm, I'm the tip of the iceberg. I'm the one who does less work than anybody else. I turn up on a big evening, walk around for seven hours, and get off. But there's the effort, the work is being done by other people throughout the year, including my togs, who have been instrumental through Janet and John CDs and other tasteful offerings, <laughs> have been able to raise in excess of three million pounds for children in need. And as I've said, I'm so proud of these people. And I'm so proud that they, they've rallied to this cause in my name. I'm just a broadcaster. I'm just somebody who sits in front of a microphone and speaks, usually without a thought in his head. Open the microphone and hope for the best. And it's the same with television. And I have had the most wonderful time. This is the important thing to remember, I think. You've all qualified and full marks to you for all the studying that you've done. It's fantastic. And you deserve your day in the sun. And I hope you'll go on to great things. But it's really, you've got to have one other thing in life. You've got to be lucky. I hate to tell you this, but you, there is an imponderable factor in life. And it's called luck. And I've been luckier than anybody I know. And so I hope, as you carry your qualifications forward, that you'll be lucky too. That not only will you, you have the intellect and the ability, that you'll have the luck, the luck that I've enjoyed. Particularly today, to receive an honorary doctorate in laws, as I've said, I'm one of the laziest people I know. I came out of school very early, went back, did philosophy. Then I thought, I don't want to study for any longer. So I went to work in a bank. Lazy. You, you spent years getting where you are today. Now, you deserve to be where you are. You deserve all the success that's going to come your way. I congratulate you on it. I don't congratulate myself. I just think that I'm, again, very lucky, very honored, very moved to have received this honorary doctorate from the University of Leicester. Thank you.